one of the institutions that have been faithful to the Word of God for these many, many years. And uh, we praise the Lord that they've not gone the way of some of the others, in the way of apostasy. Thank the Lord for those uh, Christians that stay true to Him and to His Word. So we know that some of our folks, or we call them our folks, uh, are there tonight. But you know, I've found through the years that it uh, seems like the Lord just gives a little something extra when it's a smaller group. Um, my One problem is when the group's smaller, I don't usually talk as loud, and I don't know if the other people back in the other room are going to be able to make out. Would you like to move up here? And, uh, then, can, can you hear all right back there? Okay, well... Uh, don't feel embarrassed just to get up and, and and walk up further if you can't hear. Let's read again in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. You remember we came to this verse, verse 10, where we read, Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And God here wants to uh, compare the priestly office of the Lord Jesus Christ with an Old Testament individual that we find way back in the 14th chapter of Genesis. But uh, the author says here in verse 11, of whom, that is speaking of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. The point that uh, he wants to get across is that there just aren't too many of God's people that could understand a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek even after it was explained because their spiritual perception would be so limited that they would just wouldn't get the point. And uh, so he says, and he gives the reason, verse 12, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But meat belongs to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What he's saying here is that uh, Christians are divided into milk drinkers and meat eaters. And uh, he says spiritually it would take a meat eater to understand the spiritual truth behind this subject of uh, Christ's being a high priest after the uh, order of Melchizedek. And he says uh, it wouldn't be much uh, trouble for me to explain it, but the problem's going to uh, be in your perceiving after I explain it. And so then he goes on and he explains or he exhorts first, remember uh, the book of Hebrews we pointed out is a, is a series of exhortations and warnings to those who don't follow the exhortation. So he says in verse 6, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. Now he's going to explain to us what he means by the principles or the basics. He, uh, he doesn't mean that uh, you should be unaware of the basics. Unfortunately, some Christians don't even have a good understanding of the basics. Uh, but he says, after you've mastered the basics, after you've come to understand the basics, uh, that's not the end. There's something more that you need. He says, you need to go on to perfection. And the word perfection here has the connotation of maturity. Or you need to be a perfected Christian. That is, you need to have submitted yourself to the teaching of the Holy Spirit of God that you might understand deeper spiritual things. So he says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on, that's an exhortation, unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. Then he's going to tell you what the foundational things are. Now, what he's accusing us is of uh, being like someone who would build a house, want to build a house, and they'd lay the foundation. And they say, well, that foundation uh, is pretty good. I think I'll go over here and lay, an lay it again. And so they go over and, and on another lot and they lay the foundation. And they lay the foundation, they lay the foundation, lay the foundation, never build anything on the foundation. He says, now, uh, by now you ought to have the foundation. 
Uh, and uh, you've spent so much time on that. If you don't know now, you're never going to know. So why don't we go on and build upon the foundation? Then he explains what the foundation is. He says it's uh, things like uh, uh, the, uh, repentance from dead works, that is, the matter of repentance, faith towards God, the teachings of baptism, the laying on of hands, uh, the resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. He says those are the basics of Christianity. And you ought to have already mastered those. And So let's not spend all of our time on those basics. But let us go on to something that will mature us as Christians. And he says in verse 3, And this we will do if God permits. What will we do? We'll go on beyond the basics. The only thing that would hinder our going on from the basics would be that God wouldn't permit it. <laughs> now that sounds strange. But he gives a reason why, for some, God will not permit the building. Uh, after all, if somebody gets so intrigued with the foundation, and uh, I'll assure you, uh, much of the uh, expounding of God's Word is basic, 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 basic. And most Christians spend all of their lives hearing the foundation laid. And uh, uh, pretty soon, uh, you're, you're out of tune uh, to building anything on that foundation. So he says, it's not possible for some people to go beyond the foundation. And he explains in verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. And in Luke 11, 13, we'll uh, find that that's the Holy Spirit of God. And were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and of the powers of the worlds to come. If such as these that are described in verses 4 or 5, if they shall fall, fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Well, this is strange language, and uh, there's been uh, any number of explanations. I think in the Schofield notes of the new Schofield Bible, you're given about four explanations of how uh, what this could possibly mean. Well, I don't think you can understand it unless you bracket it with the rest of the Scriptures. You start out uh, by realizing that the author wants to get across a deep spiritual truth and he says some people cannot handle such truth. And he says the reason some people can't handle the truth is that they've been enlightened and they've tasted and this word tasted uh, doesn't mean uh, taking a, a little of it on the tip of your tongue. If you want to see what a strong word it is, this word tasted is used twice. It's used in the fourth verse and in the fifth verse. Hold your place here a moment and turn back to this second chapter of Hebrews verse 9 but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man now when he tasted death I'll assure you that wasn't just a little putting a bit of it on the tip of his tongue he drank the dregs of death and now another place where it would be, uh, where that same word would be used, to, used is uh, back in First Peter. Uh, let's look there for a moment. First Peter chapter two. I just want to be sure that we see how this same word is used in other passages. First Peter two, uh, two three. See that two two is. Uh, where it says, as newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word, word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. What he means by, if you've tasted the Lord of grace, if you've ever tasted of salvation, if you've ever tasted of the grace of God. So that wouldn't mean just a, uh, like a putting a little bit of salt on the tip of your tongue. All of this descriptive material in verses 4 and 5 is descriptive of someone who was not only saved, but someone who had gone on beyond the point of just being saved. Someone who had gone on beyond the point of the ones we described in the fourth chapter, and we'll, we'll go back to that in just a moment. Now it says, if these... Now we're talking about people that God will not permit to go on. That's our subject. And he says, 
uh, if these were to fall away, that is to say, uh, if they, uh, after having come to a knowledge, then they go back into the ways of the world, if they fall away from, from the practicing of their faith, it's not possible to renew them again to repentance because that would be like Jesus Christ having to come back on the cross again for them, dying on the cross once for, uh, more than once. They have already received the benefit of his death on the cross, and uh, they have disdained that. That is to say, they've not uh, regarded that properly. And so they say, well, I, I just need to start all over again. And it says this would put him to open shame. Now, this should get our curiosity up at least, because we we should uh, want, to, want to know if there's any possibility we've fallen into such a situation that we're not permitted to go on, or if it's a if it's a common thing. And so God is going to explain it to us by uh, taking a situation from the Old Testament. You know, all through Hebrews, if you'll just remember, uh, He takes all of these. Uh, uh, instances from the Old Testament and he tells a New Testament truth and here he's going to do this in verse 7 and 8 verse 7 for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed or tilled receiveth blessings from God but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned now of course, uh, if you read that uh, carelessly, it seems to think, it seems to say that such a person is going to end up in hell, whose end is to be burned. Nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And that's what causes the problem, because if that's true, if that means that that person is going to end up in hell, then it means a person could lose their salvation, wouldn't it? And we know from other scriptures that that's not what it's teaching. So what is it saying? Well, first, let's see the picture that God wants you to get. He wants to get you to get a picture of two fields, a farmer that has two fields. And the farmer treats both fields just alike. He fertilizes each one the same. He cultivates each one the same. It, both of them get the same amount of rain from the heavens. And one field always produces that for which he tilled it. That is, if he wanted a uh, grain crop, it brought forth grain. Or whatever he tilled it for, that's what it produced. Now the other one, on whom he spends exactly the same amount of care, it always brings forth thistles and thorns. Well, what will happen? Will he destroy the field? Will they put it through an atomizer of some type and uh, just leave a vacuum there? No. What he'll do, he'll burn off that which it produces so the seeds won't get into the good field, won't he? And he'll leave that fallow. He won't fool with it anymore. Now, he might he might try it. He'd say, well, there's no reason why it shouldn't produce as well as this field will. Then he might try year after year after year after year. But eventually, if it always bore thistles and thorns, he would be rather foolish to keep up that operation forever. And he just wouldn't let it go with all its thistles and thorns because anybody knows that thistles and thorns, uh, in, uh, they don't stay where they are. They would invi invade the good field. So the only answer is that he must burn that, he must burn that which the bad field produced. He doesn't destroy the field. Now we have two pictures in history of this same thing. One of them has to do with the world system. Though God spends his grace upon this world, this physical world, and it produces. It produces not unto God. And one day God's going to have to destroy it with fire. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be utterly destroyed. As a matter of fact, he says we're going to have, he's going to remake it into something acceptable. We have the same picture with the nation of Israel. And we have this same figure of speech used. It's used in the fifth chapter of Isaiah. And we'll, we'll look there just a moment. But before we do that, let me make sure that we understand uh, how God is using the nation of Israel for a picture 
of what can happen in our own Christian lives. You remember that Israel as a nation was in a state of slavery uh, in Egypt. Well, this is a picture of our being slaves to sin. We're, the uh, Apostle Paul says we're sold under sin. That is to say, we're in the slave market of sin before we're saved. That's why we had to be redeemed. We had to be purchased out of the slave market of sin. And so God saving Israel as a nation out of the clutches of Pharaoh in the land of Egypt is a picture of his saving us out of the clutches of sin in this world. And when God uh, provided a way through that Red Sea and drowned all of the armies of Pharaoh, that's a picture for us of when he saved us out of the grasp of Satan and made it impossible for the forces of Satan to have us. That's a picture. Now, the one way we can know that is uh, the instructions that God gave to Moses in the third and fourth chapters of Exodus. He said, I saw their plight. I looked down. I saw their plight. I heard their cry. And I came down and saved them. So that's a picture for us. Now, when God did that for Israel, Israel sang a song of salvation. And that song is to be found in Exodus chapter 15. It's a song of being released. It's a redemption song. But that's not the only song that Israel sang. There's two songs in the Bible, both of which call, are called the Song of Moses. One of them is in Exodus 15, and that's the song of redemption, when Israel was redeemed from Exodus. The other song is in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, and that's the song of victory or conquest as they were going to march into the promised land and possess the land. You see, God had said, I save you out of Egypt in order to take you into a land. He didn't save them out of Egypt for them to wander all of their lives in the wilderness. And there's a picture there for us. He didn't save us that we might just wander about in this world until Christ came. He saved us to take us into a promised land, an abundant Christian life, a place where he wants to teach us and where he wants to use us to his glory. And that's what he wanted to do to Israel. He wanted to take them into the promised land. He called it a land of milk and honey. And he wanted to take them where they could learn about their God and do his work in this world. Now, can you see? In the book of Hebrews, first set of warnings are warnings for those who will not trust God to take them into the promised land. See, the example is given in, in Hebrews chapter 3 of the children of Israel who came right up to the border and they said, no, the walls are too high, the giants are too big, we'll never make it. And God says, I'll lead you in just like I led you uh, out of Egypt. These uh, foes are not, uh, not as great as Pharaoh and all of his armies, is 600 chariots. And uh, if I could lead you out of captivity from under the 600 chariots of Egypt. Don't you think I could lead you against these walled cities and the inhabitants? But they didn't trust him to do that. Then after he said, no, I'm not going to let you do it because you wouldn't believe me. Then they said, well, we think we'll go. And they tried to go in their own strength and they were slaughtered by the Amalekites who stand for the flesh. Now the picture for us there is that God invites us to go into the promised land, a product, productive land of rest. That's what the, the, uh, that's what the uh, promised land was called. All through uh, the Pentateuch, uh, God, uh, Moses is leading, but God is leading by way of Moses. He's leading them into their rest. Actually, it was a place of labor for God. But it was restful labor under his yoke. And we have the same thing when Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. He has a place of restful service for each one of his people. 
Now, it may be insignificant. Your assignment may just be enough to learn about the mind of God that you might be an effective prayer warrior. Uh, or it might be any little niche. It might be a, a niche in his work in this world that's quite disdained by people. It might be that what God has for you is, is uh, helping others that uh, are involved in his work. Uh, but whatever it is, he has a place for every Christian after you learn enough about him to fit into that place. And if you disdain it or you not trust him to take you into that, well, the time comes he says, well, I'll have to find somebody else. You take too much, uh, it's too long for you to make up your mind. And you say, well, I believe I want to go. No, you're too late. The time comes when you forfeit the right to enter in. When you refuse to go in because of unbelief, then you forfeit the right. Now, that's the warnings of chapter 3 and 4 in this book of Hebrews. There remaineth the rest of the people of God. Now, the warnings in the 6th chapter have to do with Israel after, the, the picture of Israel after they'd gone in the land. The second generation went into the land. But most of them never possessed the land. They just lived in among the inhabitants and began to do like they did. They never were permitted to do God's work in this world because they never really possessed the land. Now, that's the, that's the figure that you have here in, in chapter 6. Somebody who's saved, somebody who's even say, I'm, I'm, I'll go on with the Lord. I'll cross over Jordan. I dedicate my life for him. And then they get into the land or the place of service and they don't produce. They don't have their exercises, they don't have their senses exercised to learn enough about God to do his work properly. Now first let's go back into, um, well first uh, uh, let's look again at this chapter, this verse 7 and 8 because we need to get the picture here. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and brings forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receives blessings from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Whose end? Whose end are they talking about? The thorns and the thistles that keep coming up on the field. The works of what the field produced. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, we are called God's cultivated field. He's working us. He's telling us. And we either will bring forth that for which he tells us or we'll bring forth thistles and thorns. And what he's saying here, if we bring forth that for which he tells us, he'll tell us some more. But if we bring forth nothing but thistles and thorns, pretty soon he'll just quit fooling with us. And it's not possible for us to ever be tilled again. You'll never bring forth a crop unless God does the tilling is what he's saying. And he decides whether or not he wants to tell you and he'll tell anybody until they prove they're not going to grow anything but thistles and thorns. And then he says, well, why tell you? I'll have to find somebody else to tell. See, you are God's cultivated field. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. So uh, if you won't bring forth fruit, what kind of fruit? Well, God's fruit manifests itself in two distinct ways. Number one, the fruit of the Spirit, that is, God-like qualities. Number two, seed after its kind. He uses us to bring forth others like us. We uh, term that witnessing, or being some type of witnessing. That's fruit unto the, uh, out of the cultivated field. Anything else you do from that field is th 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 thistles and thorns, because it's not what God's telling us for. What is he telling us for? He's, what is he cultivating us for? That we will bring forth godlike qualities and that we will reproduce after our kind. That's the two reasons that he tells us. Now, if we will not produce in those areas, he calls it thistles and thorns, and he will lay us fallow, and if we, if we will not respond to his cultivation, he says, well, look, I'm not going to tell you anymore. I'm not going to, so it's impossible for us to go on. Now, do you see that? Okay, let's get back in the Old Testament and make sure we understand the typology because it's very interesting. We can leave our place in Hebrews now and let's go all the way back to Exodus chapter 15 
And let's see this song of redemption. It was the song that Israel sang just after they came out of the clutches of Egypt. And I just want you to see some of the terminology. See in verse in, in Exodus 14, verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 31, And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Look in 15.2, The Lord is my strength. See, uh, look how chapter 15 starts. Then sang Moses. See, I told you, Moses sang two songs. And he led the children of Israel in the singing of two songs, not just one. First is the song of redemption. It's the same song that your own heart sang when God saved you from the clutches of sin. And if your heart didn't sing, you didn't get saved. Because whether or not you expressed it very forcefully, outwardly or not, your heart within sang redemption song. And what it says, God saved me. That's what your heart sang. And uh, notice what uh, uh, Moses and the children of Israel are going to sing. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. That's all of Satan's forces. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he is become my salvation. See the terminology? Now look at uh, uh, verse 13. Thou in thy mercy, see, we were saved through, uh, through his mercy, hast led forth the people whom thou hast redeemed, bought back, redeemed. Notice the terminology. Verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be still as stones till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom thou hast purchased. See, that same language is used concerning our salvation. He saved us, he redeemed us, he purchased us. All through the New Testament you'll see those three terms. He is our salvation. You'll see that terminology. This is the song of being saved. And when related over to us, it's the song of every Christian heart. You see, again, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen to them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages are come. For us. Let's look at the next song. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let's look first in uh, chapter 31, verse 30. And Moses spoke in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So you see, it's another song of Moses, isn't it? Both songs are songs of Moses. Now this gets important to the understanding of the book of Revelation because you have the song of Moses mentioned in the book of Revelation. Chapter 32, Give ear, O ye heavens, I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Now God here in chapter uh, 32, verse 2, in this song, he's going to uh, draw a picture of his word being similar. He's going to draw an analogy between the rain that comes down from heaven and his word coming down. Because it's with his word that he cultivates his field. He tells it and he cultivates it and he reigns upon it with the word. Now you're going to find that the word first is going to be described as rain and then he's going to break it down into three different types of moisture. See, in chapter 32, verse 2, my doctrine or my teaching shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Now someone has likened uh, this three types of moistures to the ways that we ought to assimilate God's word. First you have the dew. That would be like your quiet time early in the morning with the Lord. Just a, a few moments with the Lord and with the word early in the morning. It's like the dew. It gets you off to a fresh start. But what happens to the dew later in the day? What what uh, produce do you know that will come into fruition if all that it has is dew? That won't suffice, will it? It gets everything off to a nice crisp start. It really starts things out well. 
You can get up in the morning, see the dew on everything, and everybody, everything's fresh and crisp. But it won't last all day. So that Christian who would try to survive on just a little, uh, my son David uh, calls it uh, the daily bread, the daily bread rut. He says uh, the problem with some Christians, they've got into the daily bread rut. That is to say, they go to their little devotional book, they read one little sentence out of that or something like that, and they think that'll uh, that'll keep them and and producing as a Christian. That gets them off to a good start, but that's not enough. Then next. Notice the small rain. Well, now, if you were to ask Donnie if uh, he had his choice, would he like a uh, about a thirty-minute thunderstorm? Just I mean, just a tor- torrential rain, or would he like an all-day gentle, little gentle rain? He said, "Well, send me the all-day gentle rain, because that would soak in, wouldn't it?" Well, this is a picture of our getting God's Word all the time, just feeding upon God's Word, you see. And then the next thing is the shower. Well, that's when we gather together, like at a Bible study or weekend conference or something like that. You see, we get a shower, a little refreshing shower. We need all three. We need the dew in the morning. We need the the gentle rain through the day. And then occasionally we need a good, healthy shower. And as a matter of fact, if we won't take our moisture that way, you know what happens? God sends a thunderstorm. Now, if we could have rain, we could have rain, we'd have rather have it anyway than in a violent storm. But if we never get it any other way, well, we have to have it that way or we'll perish, won't we? And uh, unfortunately, most of us don't get the dew in the morning and we don't get the light rain through the day, and we don't call ourselves apart to Bible studies and so forth that we might get showers. And so God has to send a thunderstorm every so often, or we'll die, or we'll perish. So in this song, you see, you can see how he's equating or, or comparing his word and his teaching, his instruction, with uh, rain in three different aspects. And if you read this whole song, uh, you would find that uh, it's a song of somebody who's already redeemed and just joying in the Lord. He, uh, he's called the rock. Notice some of the uh, uh, things. For instance, verse 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty stone, butter of the cows and milk of the sheep and the fat of the lambs. See, it's speaking of all of those things uh, which causes to grow in a joyous manner from a physical standpoint. And the Word should do these things for us. This is the, the song of somebody who was already redeemed and now is enjoying, growing in the Lord. Now this is what God's intentions was were for Israel to bring them into the special land and teach them all about himself and then send him out to the far-flung parts of the world to tell his story. And Israel failed in that. And now God has called out another people to do that. And some of them yield themselves to that and some don't. Some of us yield ourselves for what God is doing in the world. Others don't. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's showing you the difference. Now, let's go one step further with our analogy of Israel because you'll recognize by the language that this is exactly where the author of Hebrews gets his story about the fields and about the briars and about the thorns. So let's look in Isaiah chapter 5. And we have another song. Now, this is a song by the Father, Jehovah, about his son and his son's work on this earth. See verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song. The song is of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. 
And he digged it, and he gathered out the stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press of it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done uh, in it? Wherefore then, when I looked uh, for it to bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, that's that with which it was protected from the wild animals and even more so the, the scorching desert winds. Uh, I will take away its hedge, it shall be eaten up, and I'll break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down, and I will lay it waste. Now watch. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry, woe unto them. You see, he's likening the nation of Israel to a vine that he had planted in a fruitful place. And he's saying, since they will not bear that for which I planted them, he says, there's nothing more I could have done for them. He's saying, they cannot go on to perfection. The time has come. I've, I've spent all the time that I can with them, and I'm not going to cultivate them anymore. And I'm going to turn them over to the briars and the thorns. And now, for over 2,000 years, that field has laid fallow, and it's been burned with the fires of judgment by the invading armies of the world. And it says, it's nigh unto cursing. But will Israel ever be a fruitful vine? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. But not under God's program as he outlined it then. Hebrews chapter 6. God has done everything for them. They accepted their commission. They yielded themselves to being cultivated by him. They drank in the word. That is, they uh, rejoiced in the, uh, the rain from heaven. That is, they uh, uh, were in the Bible for their morning uh, dew, and they went to their Bible studies, and they read the word, and all such as that. But they did not bring forth what God was cultivating them for because they didn't have their senses exercised. They only brought forth thorns and thistles, just like Israel did. So what is he going to do? The same thing he did with the nation of Israel. He's going to reject that field forever? No. One day, he will bring that field back. Because, you see, even the non-productive Christian, if he's truly saved, again, he'll be just like Israel. One day, God will bring him back but not for the purposes that God has cultivating for in this world because he's left them fallow. Now you see, it's just a matter of finding out where the language comes from in the Old Testament and then it opens it up in the New Testament. One other scripture we want to look at along these lines and that's also in Isaiah chapter 55 because this will help us to understand the typical language, the imagery that we're being uh, shown here. This is all about enjoying God. See, uh, it's uh, ver the first verse of, of Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come buy, eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. In the last uh, verse, last section, the second verse, and let your soul delight in its fatness, incline your ear. It, it's a picture of well-being. Now, let's read on. Verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's the reason we need to be cultivated. We don't understand God. Verse 10, 
Watch it now. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thence, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, boy, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now he's saying, if the ground will receive the rain, then you're going to see something. You're going to see something happen. As, as this moisture falls down, as we learn his ways and his thoughts, then he says it shall prosper. Verse 12, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name and an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. You see, it's all a matter of whether or not we receive the cultivation or whether we don't. And what he's saying in Hebrews, if you will not receive the tender care and cultivation, if you will not be exercised by the watering of the rain, then I will take away your ability to be productive. I'll not have anything to do with you as a fruit bearer. And I'll spend my time on those who will. But if you'll be exercised by it, if you'll take in the rain that falls down, then the briars that have crept up in your life will be taken out and the, and the thorns, and you'll bring forth that for which you were tilled. You'll be God's cultivated field. You see the picture? Well, this is exactly where God is getting the imagery. Now, I read this in about four or five commentators. Each one of the four had a different idea and not one, not one, ever referred to the Old Testament scriptures after which this was made an example. Tried to write a book. I mean, uh, I'm talking about men that are well regarded. Fundamental Bible believing men that, that we, uh, uh, we uh, advise people to buy their works. And I'm telling you, not one of them, they were, each one was so anxious to expound his point of view about what the sixth chapter of Hebrews meant that not a one of them ever went back to the Old Testament and found the scriptures upon which the teaching was based. And yet they should have because all of the teaching in the book of Hebrews again and again, we've been told that it comes right from the Old Testament as, as, uh, as its basis. So, if we're confused about a scripture in the book of Hebrews, why wouldn't we try to find a corollary scripture in the Old Testament? And when we do that, we find out exactly what he means by nigh unto cursing. He means the same thing that he meant about the nation of Israel, which was, so to speak, cursed for a while or set aside for a while. And they were no longer permitted to do God's work in this world. And what he's saying is, there are some Christians who will never be permitted to do God's work in this world because they have refused to be exercised by the cultivation, and they have received the rain and have not produced. So we might say the warnings in chapter 3 and 4 are warnings to those Christians who just have no taste for going on with God at all. They're saved and that's it. But the warnings in the sixth chapter of Hebrews have to do with those Christians who did go on, who did take in the work, who did take the dew in the morning and the, and the light rain during the day and the showers, but who were not exercised by that, who, uh, who said, well, this is great, but they never produced. And pretty soon God says, I just won't let you go on any further. I'll not let you understand deep spiritual truths. Why should I? I'm cultivating you and you don't have any produce. So I'll just burn off the thistles and the thorns at the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll just be a laid fallow. Actually, he burns it off now, you might say. And he sets, sets those aside. And unfortunately, uh, so many of us are babes that we don't know a dif the difference between a field that's lying fallow and one that's producing. And that's pitiful. Now let's go back in the book of Hebrews. Remember the whole idea was when we entered this discourse that the writer 
wanted us to tell us a very precious truth about the about the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wanted to unfold this truth by taking us back to an Old Testament character named Melchizedek. Melchizedek, as I said, uh, is a character in the 14th chapter of Genesis, and he's also mentioned in the 110th Psalm. So he, he says, I want to apply that Old Testament uh, scripture to your high priest, and I want to tell you something very precious about your high priest. But some of you would never get the point because your ears have become so dull that you just are not tuned in to, to deep spiritual truths. So it wouldn't do any good because he says there's some of you that have taken in the word and taken in the rain and taken in the rain and you're your old self, you refuse to be exercised by it and God has said, I'll not permit them to go further. I've expended all the effort on them that I intend to. Now look in verse 9 of chapter 6. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Better than what? better than these fields that have to be burnt off and left fallow. In other words, he says, uh, to you who I'm writing this, I'm convinced that although you may, still may have been babe, be babes, when you ought to be teachers, still I'm convinced that you haven't just hardened your heart against God's cultivation and that you're still eager to be cultivated by God. And he says, I have some evidence of that. I, I'm not just guessing. I have some foundations for these beliefs about you. He says, but beloved, we, he's using an editorial we. Paul does this very often. That's one of the reasons people believe that Paul is one of the authors, or is the author of the book of, he the human author of the book of Hebrews, is because uh, he delights to use this editorial we. He means me, but it's a, it's a way of saying me without the being egotistic, see. Uh, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. What is he saying? Now I know I'm telling you about somebody who cannot go on. And I've given you the reason why God doesn't permit them to go on. Because God does not permit everybody to go on. And I've given you the reason. Now what I want to say to you is, I don't believe you're in that category at all. I just don't believe that. He says, uh, he says I, I think better things. I see things in your life that accompany salvation or things that are supposed to manifest themselves after somebody's saved. And he's going to tell what some of those things are. See in verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love which ye have shown toward his name and that ye have ministered to the saints. And you do minister. And we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He says, I know you don't fit into this category. He says, I see the fruit in your lives. I see that you support those who minister God's word. I see that you have a desire to see God work in this world. And I see that you have an inclination to want to be a part of that. And I see you yielding your lives that he might uh, take away your wrath and your temper and all these uh, little hatreds and uh, snide remarks and all. I see him working on that and I see you responding. I see fruit. So he says, I know that you're not one of these that cannot go on. And to prove that, you know what he does? He spends several verses telling them what it is to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. See, now he's going to he's going to have a few words about hope. Uh, next week we'll start with verse eleven, and uh, we'll proceed on down through verse 19. All of that has to do with what God calls hope. And we need to understand that. But then you see, beginning in verse 20 of chapter 6, wherefore the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now if you were to look carefully, 
you'd find uh, Melchizedek several times in chapter 7, in, uh, in verse 1, in verse 10, in verse uh, 11, in verse 15, in verse 17, uh, in verse 21. See, he's going to say a lot about Melchizedek, isn't he? So, uh, he's decided, well, some of you may be dull of hearing, but I believe if I, if I get you tuned up just right, and if I really open this thing up, I believe some of you are uh, spiritually aware enough that you can understand what it is about the high priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's like Melchizedek. So I'm going to go ahead and explain it. And he does. What is the point of all of this? Well, first, in the fifth chapter, he tells us what our high priest is. You see, he doesn't begin till the fifth chapter to tell us all about our high priest. He mentions him at the end of the fourth chapter. But he doesn't begin to tell us all about because those who were warned in chapters 3 and 4 <laughs> never would even avail themselves of the services of a high priest, and most Christians never have. They never got far enough along that God could say, look, you've been enlightened and you've tasted of the, the word of God. You've had all this advancement. They never even got that far, just like the children of Israel that never even went into the uh, promised land. The warnings in, in chapter 6 are for those who have gone into the promised land but didn't produce after they got there. See the difference? The warnings in chapters 3 and 4 are those who would never enter in. They never even made it across the Jordan. Uh, they turned back at Kadesh Barnea. They spend the rest of their lives in the wilderness. But there's another group of Christians that do go in. Trust God to batter down the walls. Uh, uh, trust God to show them uh, his ways and so forth. But when they get into the land, they get too interested in other things and they never yield themselves to God's cultivation. And God patiently works with them and pretty soon he just rejects them. So you can see the Christians that are described in chapter 6 as not being permitted to go on have already advanced considerably further than those back in chapters 3 and 4 that would never even enter in, that were wilderness Christians. And then when we get to chapter 10, after he's told us all about our high priest, we're going to find another type of Christian that's worn, and that's the Christian that not only went into the promised land, but was exercised and who produced good fruit and who was a part of God's work, and who gained all the insights, and yielded themselves to be cultivated, who manifested the fruit of the Spirit, and then turned back into sin. So you have a progression, see. The warnings in chapters 3 and 4 directed at those Christians who never entered in. The warnings in chapter 6 to those Christians who entered in, but never produced and the warnings in chapter 10 to those who entered in and produced and then turned back. And that's why I think this is a book that's uh, so needful for our time because there are many around us that are in all of those categories and they need the lessons that are here. So now, beginning where we are now, we're going to learn about this, our great high priest. There's one rather sad thing about teaching a Bible study like this. And uh, uh, it, it's always this way, so uh, I know it's, it bothers God more than it bothers me. But you see, God writes these books. And, and by the way, this is why uh, most of us don't get this type of teaching in our church. You see, God writes these books on such a basis that you must build on top of what's gone on before. And the people, for instance, who haven't uh, come to an understanding of what we've been studying today, they'll never really get the point of what goes on from here on. Because it's built like a house. And if you don't build all the way up, you just uh, 
uh, you, you never get the house properly built. And so really, if you, if you want to understand what God is saying, you have to somehow make up your mind whether God wants you to have this or whether he wants you to have something else. Make up your mind and then set your mind on that course and not be uh, drawn aside by other good things. Maybe you don't see that, but I do. And I, 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 I see it's pitiful many times the way uh, Christians choose. And maybe what they choose would be what would be considered very good. But it simply doesn't build anything for them on the foundation that's already been laid. It's going off and starting another foundation. And most of us do that. We never get a building built. We, we build a little bit here, and then we uh, say, well, now look, I believe that's a, uh, that, that's a good building over there. I'm going to build there. It would be better if we had our little, little hut, you know, whatever it is, and build it rather than to ha- leave this foundation and go over here and try to start a foundation for a mansion so to speak. And uh, as I say, uh, (laughs) it'll always be that way. But unfortunately, most Christians never stick to one of God's books long enough. Now, that doesn't mean that a person has to come to every Bible study, so to speak. But, But this is what I mean. Most of the people who didn't come tonight never will have that part of the building. Now, maybe they were supposed to be somewhere else. Now, everybody wasn't supposed to be here. But what I'm saying is that they won't get a proper foundation unless somehow they get into the book themselves or somehow get the foundation. Now, maybe what the Lord would have some of you to do if you comprehended this is in your own best way to share it with somebody that just won't get the rest of the building unless they get this building block. Because, you see, we're not going to have this part again, are we? We, Let us go on. We can't lay uh, this foundation again and again and again, can we? We must build on for those who are building. And so maybe what the Lord might have you to do is uh, to the extent that you've comprehended and assimilated this in your own thinking, there may be somebody uh, that will be missing one of the stages in their building. And I'm very sincere when I say that I'm sure that it's not practical in God's scheme of doing things for all of us to be at every Bible study, for instance, in a study of the book of Hebrews. But if we really want to know that book, to whatever we weren't able to be there, we need to recognize that we might have left out some of the foundation, mightn't we? Let's pray. Lord, we pray again that uh, you'd exercise us with your word and that we'd have a deep desire to be cultivated that we might bring forth fruit and that we might thereby be eligible to go on to full maturity, and that we might please the great heart of our Lord, and that he would show us his truths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.